Hey guys and welcome back to Walk Wild. This is the Pan American Q&A that I promised I would do. So thank you to everyone who sent in their messages on YouTube and Twitter and Instagram and in person as well. I had lots of interesting questions there. I've collected them together into 10 questions because sometimes quite a few of you ask the same question. And I'm going to do my best to answer them for you now so you can get an idea about what it is I'm doing on my crazy Pan American adventure. So, to begin with, a lot of people just asked, where are you going? What, what exactly is the Pan American Highway? It's probably a good place to begin. So it's a network of roads that stretches 19,000 miles and it goes from the top of Alaska to the bottom of Argentina. So it goes from Prudhoe Bay, is the place in Alaska, to Ushuaia. And that basically covers all of the Americas. It's technically known, known as the longest motorable road in the world, but that's under some contention because of an area called the Darien Gap, which I will talk about later in the video because a lot of you have been asking about that because it's very unusual. But basically, we're not going to just stick to the Pan American Highway. Obviously that would be a bit ridiculous if we were only driving on the motorway. We want to explore as much of the countries we're visiting as possible. Um, it's not just about doing it a sort of road trip, getting from A to B. We also want to experience everywhere we're seeing. And so we will be going away from this Pan American Highway um, and exploring what we can throughout the countries. So we are going to visit 16 countries probably in total. It does, it may vary, but um, we're gonna start from North America, so it's going to be Canada, United States of America, Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile and Argentina. We might not go to all of those, but we, bet we probably will, it's only if maybe for some reason we skip one out, but I imagine that that's the plan to go to those 16. There's a chance we may even go to sort of Venezuela, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay. We don't really know, to be honest. Those, the there are extras which we may go to, but Venezuela is probably going to be very difficult to get into. But it's a possibility, and um, we're kind of just going to see what happens along the way. So, question number two is: Are you travelling the whole route in a van? Yes, is the short answer. We want to live out of a van and do the whole van life thing for a number of reasons. Firstly is that it allows us to sort of store all our outdoor hiking gear and activity gear with us. So that's sort of mountaineering equipment, rock climbing stuff, maybe even skis and surfboards and fishing rods. And at the end of the day, we're adventurous people. You know, we want to go out and do all these outdoor activities in nature. And it's really useful for us to be able to store them and travel around to every area and do the activities we want to do. It also allows us to cook inside the van and just to have a living area, which means we'll save on accommodation. We'll also save on transport. And it you know, basically means we can do things at our own pace and see everything at, at the speed we want to to make the most of our trip. Occasionally we're going to visit hostels because that's going to be quite nice for us to meet people. Maybe in some of the bigger cities we might want to stay at a hostel. I could offer to give other people lifts and you know engage with other travellers as well. We may do sort of B&Bs or apartments for shorter periods. Again, occasionally if we just get completely burnt out and we need to rest for a week to do washing and to just maybe get on with some work and have a relax, then we're not ruling that out either. So that's a possibility, but ultimately this is going to be a trip that's done in a van, you know, we're going to be driving everywhere. And that leads us on to the next question, which is what are you looking for in a van or a camper? The age, the model, converted, unconverted, the price? Well, I'll preface this by saying we know embarrassingly little about vans, which is probably an alarm bell for some of you as this, I've just said this is gonna be an enormous 19,000 mile road trip. But we know about, you know, we're obviously good drivers, but we don't know that much about camper vans. And it's hard for us to predict exactly what the offers are gonna be when we get there. We still haven't decided whether we want to convert it ourselves or buy an unconverted one that's ready to go. They both have pros and cons, and it's gonna depend really, like I said, on what we see. We did actually, uh, we found an ambulance that was on for sale in Fairbanks, Alaska, which we <laughs> toyed with buying, which would probably be a logistical nightmare, but would have been quite funny. Uh, would have sort of been 
motorcycle diaries-esque when they're pretending to be doctors. But anyway, we're going to be doing a £5,000 budget, which um, yeah, so £2,500 each is what we're hoping to get something pretty good. We, and we know we're going to need extra money for repairs along the way and for crossing borders and tax and insurance and gas. So there are obviously costs all over the shop, but ultimately we want to get something good to start with. And we want a common model, maybe something like Ford or I don't know, an American model, just because we need, if we get stuck in a Colombian jungle or in the Atacama Desert in Chile, who, who, whoever knows, if we get stuck somewhere really difficult and we need replacement parts and we have a really unusual model that no one's ever heard of, then it's going to cause us all sorts of problems. We need to get parts shipped to where we are and if we have van that no one knows how to fix as well, no mechanics know what to do with, then we could really be slowing ourselves down later on in the trip. So we want something reliable and um, we don't want it to be too big and too cumbersome because that's going to make it difficult to go along these really bad roads we'll likely face, you know, muddy roads um, with lots of potholes, mountain roads, all this kind of thing. And driving around these cities in a big van will be pretty awful. That said, it is our home, so maybe that's something we're going to have to put up to. Clearly, there are going to be a lot of compromises and, you know, we are also going to have a tent with us as well. So if you want to sleep outside, one of us can. We, we want to have a cooking area. You know, some vans come with a shower and a toilet as well and a proper cooking setup. But it really depends what we've seen when we get there. And I think we'll know when we see the right model. That's going to be part of the adventure, really. Just what are we going to find? Who knows? And question four is, are you worried about driving through any dangerous areas or do you have any safety concerns? I have to say, not really. Interestingly, my biggest concern, which no one asked about, is COVID. I'm still most concerned about how that's going to inhibit us in our trip. I mean, certainly we can't get to Alaska right now, which is where we wanted to start the trip because of COVID. So that's the first stopping block and I don't know how much more of an issue that's going to cause us as the months go by but that is my biggest concern. I'm definitely not looking forward to the borders. The borders between the countries are going to be the worst areas without a doubt. That's going to be the most stressful time of our trip. They're going to be sort of corrupt officials and border guards. You don't know who to believe and who not to believe. People asking for bribes. Soldiers standing there with weapons, you know, trying to get money off you. It could be a really horrible time. So we're gonna to get to the borders for as early as possible in the morning when it opens and give ourselves the whole day to cross every time and just hope we have all our paperwork and everything in order. Other than that, we'll avoid driving at night, obviously. Uh, that's when they say bandits can attack, but I don't really believe that's much of a problem, mainly as to stop you hitting livestock or to careening off the road. Obviously we will avoid this, the areas that are considered super dangerous, but I'm actually not that concerned about that. I think it's easy It's easy to think in your mind, oh, all these countries are so dangerous and you get there and you're like, well, people are just living here. This is just a normal area. Not everyone's after you and trying to attack you. You just gotta be discreet and street smart and kind of, I feel like I've done enough traveling to hopefully know when I'm in a dangerous situation and when to get out. So I'm not too worried about people necessarily. I think there'll be some dangerous mountain roads, I'm sure, and things like that. And, we don't want to drive and we're tired. So it would just be a lot of um, using, using our best judgment, to be honest. And talking about dangerous roads, I think this brings us on to question five, which was by far the most asked question, which is what is the Darien Gap? How do you cross it? You know, people were asking me, am I going to walk over it? What happens when you reach the Panama Canal? How do you get your van through Central America? What is the Darien Gap? How are you getting across the Darien Gap? Loads of you are asking about it, so I'm just going to try and break it down for you guys. Essentially, it's a 66 mile break in the road between Panama and Colombia. So it separates Central America from South America. And it is a dense, disease ridden jungle on the Panama side. And then it is a mountainous area on the Colombian side. And it is apparently full of drug smugglers and bandits and kind of militia. So it gets a bad, very, very bad name. People don't drive through it. There have been expeditions where four by four crews have gone through and it's taken them hundreds of days and special adventurous people and army officers and stuff try to get through and it's been hell on earth. So it's certainly not a place 
to be crossed. The alternative, which is what we're planning on doing, is shipping our van from Panama to Colombia. So I think it's Colón in Panama, which is where you can load it on, which is near the Panama Canal, and then you um, put it in a container box on a container ship and send it over to Cartagena, I think it is, in Colombia. And um, then we pick it up and we either fly or take a boat and pick it up in Colombia and wait for it to arrive. There's the possibility of splitting a container box with someone else to make the price cheaper, so putting two vehicles in there. There's loads of really complicated things of import tax and whether or not you get it shipped fast or slow or how big your vehicle is. And ultimately there are gonna be a lot of uh, things that we have to figure out when we get there. But we may not be in Panama and facing this issue for another 10 or 12 months. So I'm not thinking about this right now as the top of my head, but I certainly have a plan and that's gonna to be to ship the van for when we get there. So the next question I get, got asked was, how long are you going to be in Canada or what are you going to do about traveling between Canada and the US considering how things are at the minute? Are you going to have to backtrack or you know, loop round or something like that? And the aim is to be in Canada and the US for six months. So we want a nice long time there. We actually currently have a Canadian visa for six months. So we will be flying to Vancouver with the possibility of staying in Canada for that full six months, although that isn't our plan. We don't necessarily want to do that, but we can do that. And then we can get a US visa, which is three months, or well, that's the electronic visa, or we have to get a B2 tourist visa, which is six months, but that'll be a bit more complicated. Obviously, we can't travel to the US yet, so this is all ifs and buts, but that is the aim. We need to give time for COVID to cool off basically, if that makes any sense. We want to spend time in Canada because they're doing really well with their vaccinations and we know we can travel there. And then we can hopefully go on to the US and then down to Mexico and continue when things are getting a bit better. The initial stage of the trip is pretty questionable at the moment in terms of we don't really know what we're gonna start with. Obviously we're gonna to get to Vancouver and it's gonna be super tempting to stay around Vancouver, Vancouver Island and explore there, but winter is also on the way and we want to enjoy the autumn in that area. And we think that maybe we, we might fly up north to, to Dawson City or Whitehorse and spend some time in the Yukon. We might be able to wait around for a week or two and then we can go into Alaska as we always wanted. We might buy a van in Vancouver and drive up through the Rockies and through British Columbia into the Yukon during the autumn and then loop back round through Edmonton and Calgary Banff and Jasper National Parks and Whistler when it gets colder and snows up in the winter. You know, there's a lot of questions there. Uh, ultimately, it's a huge distance as well. So I'm a little unsure about buying a van in Vancouver and then looping all the way around. I'd sort of rather fly up and then buy a van and come down. But I think you guys are just gonna have to follow along with our adventure and see what decisions we make because that is a bit unconfirmed at the minute, even though it is the first part of our trip. Exciting. Question number seven, which was also quite a few of you asked, which is how are you funding this trip or how are you paying for this trip? And do you plan on working along the way? So James and I have been saving up for this trip and planning for maybe one, definitely one year, maybe even up to two years. And we've done a lot of jobs in that time. We've been gardeners, laborers, freelance writers, ghost writers, content writers, waiters, barmen, food truck workers, restaurant supervisors, pretty much you name it. And we've been living at home or in as cheap accommodation as possible, not been going on holiday, not spending money on loads of unnecessary material items or nights out or just generally trying to save wherever we possibly can. It's been a long process. Our aim was always to get to £10,000 each. That was the figure. It was kind of an arbitrary figure, but it felt like one that we thought would be good. Other than that, I've been working really hard on trying to get this digital nomad lifestyle set up. So I've spent a long time trying to build a network. I basically spent six months doing a course at the London School of Journalism to teach me how to be a freelance travel writer so that I can write articles uh, for magazines and newspapers and get paid as I'm going along. I then also use channels like Fiverr and Upwork to get ghost writing jobs and content writing jobs. I'm leaning away from that a bit because I ultimately want to write and produce 
work that has my name on it. I don't really like doing it for other people for lower money, but that's a backup if I need to get money on the road. And then also, of course, I've been building Walk Wild as a brand. So I do get some money from sponsorship and advertisement, and I hope that I can continue to build that as I'm on this trip. So there are a few ways we're hoping to keep funding our journey along the way. If needs be, we might stop in a country for a while. We might do some work. We might do some volunteering to get accommodation for a hostel while we also do these other tasks I've talked about. And you know, it's really going to be just to see how it goes, how, how far our money goes along the way. Question eight is how do you pack for a trip like this? And the truth is the longer the trip, the less you pack. That's always what I've found. Every backpacking trip I've gone on, I, uh, or whenever I've gone traveling, I've always bought one of those big hiking backpacks and then a rucksack and that's it. And I fit everything in there. This is gonna be a hard one because the conditions vary from temperate to tropics to Arctic to desert and everything in between. I mean, we go through two continents and we cross through basically almost, you know, the North Pole to the South Pole through the equator. So it's going to be an enormous change in conditions. Ultimately, you can't pack for everything though. You, you just can't. It's impossible. You wouldn't fit it all in. So I'm aiming for functionality and multi-purpose items. You know, I'm kind of packing like I would an outdoor hiking gear and I bring all the things I'd usually take with me on a multi-day camping or hiking trip. So that'd be my tent, my sleeping bag, hiking trousers, hiking boots, but then also down jacket hat and gloves and I've also got shorts, swimming trunks, all those kind of things in there as well. The only difference is this time I'm also bringing my laptop and my electronics to work on the road, but uh, I'm going to have to buy things along the way, basically simply. I'm just keeping it really simple with my, with my clothing and if I need something desperately when I'm out there, then I'll get it. You know, it's not the end of the world. I don't have to bring everything with me and I'd much rather be lightweight than just carry way too much stuff that I end up throwing away anyway. Question nine. Are you going to collaborate with other YouTubers along the way? Yes, definitely. Uh, we want to meet as many people as possible. That's one of the reasons we are doing this trip because we're very interested in the cultures and the people we meet around the world. So if you're watching this and you notice that we're coming near to you, please reach out because we'd love to meet you. And ultimately there's no better person to show you around than locals, than the people who know the area. And if anyone wants to hang out with us and show us their local area, we, we would love, love to speak to you. So don't hesitate to reach out. And we're really excited to meet other adventurous types and out, you know, experience the outdoor community in other countries. And that's a really exciting thing for us. You know, meeting people around the world is, is something we love to do. So yes, definitely. And question number 10, the final question. What are you most excited for? That's a big question. I don't know if it's necessarily a specific thing. It's mainly, I guess, the sort of the freedom, the happiness I feel whenever I'm traveling. It's kind of lift the weight that's been on me all this time when I've been locked down and not been able to travel. 17 months it's been since I've been on a plane or left the UK. You know, I want to go back to what I find fulfilling in my life and that, that's traveling, that's adventures, that's exploring. I'm looking forward to just doing daring expeditions and pushing myself physically and mentally and challenging myself to do all these incredible adventures I've always dreamed of. I don't want to put anything off anymore. You know, I'm not getting any younger. This trip isn't going to get easier to do the older I get. So I'm ready to do it now. And I just want to take everything as it comes. And I'm looking forward to learning some new skills when I'm out there, you know, rock climbing, mountaineering, bushcraft, and improving the hobbies I already like doing, like hiking, fishing, wild swimming, my mechanical knowledge. So how I am with a car, I'm very excited for food along the whole trip as well. You know, pit barbecues, deep south in America, uh, Mexican cuisine, definitely love Mexican food, it's one of my favorite in the world. Argentinian steak and red wine, South American coffee, tropical fruit, fresh fish, all these kind of things, really excited for. I guess more specific locations, the ones that stand out. I mean, this is this is only a sh things that come to mind. Is it's you know the list goes on and on, but Alaska, Vancouver Island, the Yukon, Montana, Wyoming, Utah, Deep South, Texas, Vegas, Yucatan Peninsula, 
pretty much all of Mexico. I can't wait to see all the towns and all the interesting conquistador history there and everything be before that as well. Mayan ruins and Aztecs, the cultures, the Belizean beaches, the Guatemala and Nicaraguan lakes, towns and volcanoes, the Costa Rican jungles and wildlife, Machu Picchu of course, the Galapagos, I'm a biologist after all and if I can afford it then I certainly want to go there. Maybe an additional trip to Easter Island as well, I'm not sure we'll have enough money for that but that's a thought. Uh, visiting the Andes, the Bolivian salt flats, the Atacama Desert, Torres del Pine National Park in Patagonia, I've been dreaming of since I was a little boy. So I really have a lot to look forward to and the only place to see it all is here. It's at Walk Wilds on my YouTube, my website, and my Instagram, my Twitter. If you guys are interested then please follow along, comment and engage and this is going to be the adventure of a lifetime and I can't believe it's only a few days now till I'm heading off and I'm going to be away for a year, a year and a half and I'm just going to hope that I can share everything with you guys and that you'll enjoy the adventure and the experience along the way. So thank you for your questions, thanks for engaging, I hope I've answered them adequately, if not you can ask me another question below and I'll happily answer and all I can say now is please like and subscribe and here is to my next massive adventure. Thank you guys and see you next time.